Chapter 8, an overview of tooth development. There's going to be two major phases to tooth development. The first begins during the first trimester of embryonic development. That's going to be the formation of the crown. This will occur in four basic stages, initiation, bud, cap, and bell. Root development isn't going to begin until childhood, and this will cause eruption of either the primary or permanent dentition. This is where cementum and the rest of the pulp will begin forming, as well as the periodontal ligaments and alveolar bone tissue. Luckily for us, the primary and permanent dentitions follow the same basic growth patterns, with the major difference that the permanent dentition begins growing off of the primary dentition, with the exception of the third molars. Some basic terminology to begin with. Odontogenesis is the formation of teeth, otherwise known as tooth development. For the primary dentition, this begins during the sixth to seventh week of prenatal development. So this is happening at the same time that the upper and lower jaws are forming. The palate hasn't even finished forming yet. The permanent dentition begins growing around the 10th to 12th week of prenatal development. So right around the time that the hard palate fuses. A little bit of review. We're going to talk about morphogens in this chapter. Morphogens are chemicals secreted into the extracellular matrix in a gradient, with high levels of morphogen being found near the cell that's secreting it. And the further and further away you get from that cell, the amount of that morphogen is lower. Morphogens are signaling molecules that might trigger cell division, or in some cases they might inhibit cell division. Some morphogens may trigger differentiation, causing a cell to turn into a new specialized type of cell. Or some morphogens inhibit differentiation and keep that cell in a stem cell-like state. If cells in an area begin to proliferate, we would first call that area a placode, a cluster of more cells in one place than in surrounding areas. Placodes will eventually become appendages, things that stick outwards or inwards from that region. Appendages can be large organs, like your arms and legs, or your ears and your eyes. Or they can be small organs, like hair follicles and teeth. Now, a lot of people wouldn't consider hair and teeth to be appendages, but they should. The first step in tooth formation is the initiation stage, meaning this is just where we begin to grow a tooth. This is a very important stage. This is where we get the spacing of all of the primary and permanent teeth. This happens during the sixth week of development. That means we don't even have a mouth yet. There's still just this inward pocket called the stomodium lined by ectoderm. And the jaws haven't finished forming yet either. They are still growing. During this stage, the outer ectoderm will become oral epithelium unless it is told to become a tooth bud. Deep to the ectoderm is mesenchyme produced by neural crest cells or by mesoderm. The neural crest cells, of course, have migrated from the central nervous system, and these are going to be the ones that release morphogens that tell the body where to form teeth. If you don't get signals from these neural crest cells, that's where the outer ectoderm just becomes plain old oral epithelium. Two morphogens that are important for tooth formation are the BMPs and FGFs. BMP stands for bone morphogen protein. Only instead of inducing bone formation, we're going to be inducing tooth formation here. BMPs are secreted by the neural crest cells, binding to oral epithelial cells onto their cell surface receptors, and it will activate cell division and differentiation, forming tooth placodes.
FGFs, which stands for fibroblast growth factor, inhibit the production of BMPs, and this will inhibit tooth bud formation, ensuring that there is even spacing between teeth. Once a small region of the oral epithelium divides more than neighboring regions, we get a placode. So we can point to this structure and say, ultimately a tooth is going to form here. We may also call this placode the dental lamina. So this wraps up the initiation stage, but these cells are going to continue to divide. As the cells continue to divide, they have nowhere to go to their left and right. So instead, we've got a choice to either bulge outwards or invaginate. And in this case, the cells will invaginate inwards. And as we get more cells, more of these epithelial cells, this leads us to the bud stage. The epithelium begins proliferating and invaginating inwards deeper into the mesenchyme. At the end of this process, we should have 10 buds in the maxilla and the mandible. In addition to inducing the rapid growth of nearby epithelial cells, the neural crest cells will induce the rapid cell division of mesenchymal stem cells. So we will get more cells just underneath this invaginating bud. The rapid accumulation of mesenchymal stem cells in one spot produces a barrier in which the invaginating epithelial cells run into. These epithelial cells have an easier time migrating through the mucousy extracellular matrix made by this bluish, in this picture, mesenchyme. But in the region of the dental papilla, which is what we're going to call the region that has a higher number of mesenchymal stem cells right about here, these migrating epithelial cells have a harder time pushing them out of the way than they do loose extracellular matrix. And now, instead, the invaginating bud has to grow around these newly formed masses of mesenchymal stem cells. So the shape of the bud changes to resemble more of a hat or a cap. So around the ninth or 10th week, we say that the tooth development has entered the cap stage. It's at this stage that some of these cells begin to differentiate, no longer being just plain old ectodermal and mesenchymal cells. The invaginating epithelial cells will form the enamel organ. And ultimately, pretty soon, this will begin forming enamel. The underlying mesenchymal cells will turn into the dentin and pulp tissues. Between these two exists a thin basement membrane that's called the dentino-enamel junction. The cells surrounding this area are called the dental sac. These are also mesenchymal stem cells, but these have a mesodermal origin rather than neural crest tissue. These cells will form the cementum, the periodontium and periodontal ligament, and even alveolar bone. Here I have an actual histology image for those that don't trust my cartoons where we can see labeled A, the enamel organ, and labeled in B here is the dental papilla. It's around the edges here that we have the dental sac. So by the end of the cap stage, we have the beginnings of all of the primary dentition. That means we have 10 caps in the maxilla, and 10 caps in the mandible. Another way of saying this is we've initiated the formation of all of the primary teeth.
They haven't finished forming teeth yet, but we at least know exactly where the teeth are going to form. It's at this stage, on the lingual side of the cap stage, that there will be an increased amount of growth of these ectodermal cells that will form the permanent dentition. So we begin forming the permanent teeth even before the primary teeth have even begun forming enamel or dentin. We are still just ectodermal cells and mesenchymal stem cells. So that leads us to this slide here where we clarify the difference between succedaneous and non-succedaneous teeth. For the permanent dentition, if they are succedaneous, that means that those permanent teeth form off of the tooth buds of their primary predecessors. This includes all of the anterior teeth and premolars. Non-succedaneous teeth have only one tooth bud that forms off of the oral epithelium. They develop simply like primary dentition without a second tooth bud growing off of the first. That leads us to the bell stage, where the epithelial cells continue to grow around this dental papilla here in the center. Only now, instead of resembling a hat, we're growing bigger and resembling more of a bell shape. This is where we truly begin differentiation. At this stage, the epithelial cells can be divided into two types. We've got an outer and an inner enamel epithelium. The outer enamel epithelium are more cuboidal in shape, whereas the inner ones are more columnar in shape. Their shape isn't really all of that important other than they look different. What's more important to us is their location. Take a look over here and you'll notice that the outer enamel epithelium do not touch these mesenchymal stem cells down here in the dental papilla, whereas the inner enamel epithelium do. That's what truly differentiates these two types of epithelial cells, whether they come into contact with the dental papilla or not. The ones that do will be induced to form ameloblasts. There's some other epithelial cells here in the bell stage in between the outer and the inner. Of the two, the stellate reticulum is going to be more important to us. These are named because they're shaped like stars. These epithelial cells produce a bunch of extracellular matrix, which is rather strange for an epithelium. Usually, in an epithelium, the cells are connected to other cells, but in this space, they resemble more of a connective tissue. But don't let looks deceive you. Judging by their lineage or who their family members are, these are definitely epithelial cells. There's also a layer of flat cells called the stratum intermedium that we will not be discussing. At this time, the dental papilla also begins to differentiate. And once again, we're gonna care more about location rather than their shape. It's the outer cells that will differentiate into odontoblasts. And you may notice that these cells here are the ones that are touching the inner enamel epithelium, whereas these cells down here, the central cells, do not. And it's because of this that the central cells will turn into regular connective tissue stuff like fibroblasts and endothelial cells. But the mesenchymal stem cells that are touching the inner enamel epithelium are going to turn into some very specialized cells called odontoblasts. Once again, let me show you an actual histology image. Here is the outer enamel epithelium, a layer of epithelial cells. In the middle, we've got a bunch of stellate reticulum and stratum intermedium. It'll be really difficult to tell the difference between these two, 
What you should notice though is in this middle area, the cells aren't tightly packed together. And if you didn't know any better, you might say that that looks more like a connective tissue rather than an epithelium. But the innermost layer, just like the outermost layer, looks like a traditional epithelium with all the cells connected to neighboring cells on all other sides. This particular epithelium has more of a columnar shape. Now let's go back to cartoons. It's these inner enamel epithelial cells, the innermost ones that are gonna turn into pre-ameloblasts. They're going to do so because they receive signals from the underlying mesenchymal cells that came from the neural crest tissue. It's the inner enamel epithelium that will next release a signal that will tell the nearby mesenchymal stem cells to turn into odontoblasts. Again, it's only the ones that come into close contact with the inner enamel epithelium that will turn into those odontoblasts. Now, you'll notice on the previous slide, I said pre-ameloblasts. They're not producing enamel yet, but here I've said odontoblasts, and that's because these cells here in blue, do indeed begin forming dentin. It's not going to be calcified yet, so we should really call it pre-dentin. But dentin formation begins before enamel formation. And for this reason, layers of dentin in a tooth are always going to be a bit thicker than the layer of enamel tissue. At this point, the pre-ameloblasts are now in a different environment. They have come into contact with pre-dentin. And these cells, coming into contact with that pre-dentin on one side, that's this side here, and they're in contact with the stellate reticulum on the other side, that is what induces them to differentiate into a true ameloblast and they will begin secreting enamel. So the odontoblasts have already begun secreting pre-dentin. They continue to do so, but now the ameloblasts will begin secreting enamel. You may notice that in my cartoon, the cells of the enamel versus the dentin look a little bit different. The enamel producing cells secrete enamel from this little bump here called Tomes process. That will probably be on a license exam somewhere. Whereas the odontoblasts leave behind this dentinal tubule here filled with their odontoblastic process. So the odontoblasts, unlike the ameloblasts, remain in contact with all of the dentin that they have secreted, thanks to this long odontoblastic process. The ameloblasts, on the other hand, are moving away from the enamel that they have produced. They do not leave behind a long extension through the entire region of enamel they maintain just this tiny little bump here called Tomes process. The odontoblastic processes, which are part of the odontoblast cells here, are found within dentinal tubules. Those would be like the little tunnels in the dentin that the processes live in. These tissues are forming in an immature state. They are pre-enamel and pre-dentin. They haven't begun to calcify to form the mature tissue. That calcification will occur later. The odontoblasts will always remain just deep to the dentin that they have formed. The ameloblasts, on the other hand, will ultimately disappear during the eruption of the tooth. This process will continue 
as we add layer upon layer of dentin and enamel. And of course, you remember we call that appositional growth, where we add layer upon layer. And then later, these tissues will mature as they fully mineralize into the different types of tissue, enamel, dentin. So that was a quick overview of the formation of enamel and dentin. I'll be going into those processes in more detail in upcoming chapters. But that was all happening during embryogenesis, and we form the crowns of the teeth. Next up, we're going to fast forward in time until after we are born, and this will cover the formation of the roots. This doesn't occur until the begins start to erupt. The roots are going to form from structures called the cervical loops. The cervical loops are going to be made by just inner and outer enamel epithelium. The timing of tooth development, like almost everything in the human body with the exception of the GI tract, occurs in an anterior to posterior direction. In the case of teeth, the crowns will form first, beginning during the first trimester, and the roots do not begin to form until much later as the teeth erupt. The roots form from a structure called the cervical loop. This was the edge of the cap as it grew around the dental papilla. The cervical loop forms what is known as Hertwig's epithelial root sheath, which, ex which is composed of just two cell types, the inner and the outer enamel epithelium. The inner enamel epithelium will do just what it did around the dental papilla. It will induce mesenchymal stem cells to start forming dentin, causing them to differentiate into odontoblasts. This will form the dentin of the roots, which is continuous with the dentin of the crown. As the inner enamel epithelium induces the neuromesenchymal stem cells to differentiate into odontoblasts, those odontoblasts in turn trigger the differentiation of their neighboring inner enamel epithelial cells. However, these inner enamel epithelial cells are not in contact with stellate reticulum the way that the IEE was in the crown. Therefore, in the roots, no ameloblasts are produced and no enamel is formed. Most of the inner enamel epithelial cells will be removed by apoptosis because they are not needed to form any permanent tissues. However, some of them persist and get surrounded by cementum. These will be called the epithelial rests of Malassé. We're not entirely sure if these cells have any function or whether they simply didn't do what they were supposed to do, undergo apoptosis. But there is evidence that they may be capable of triggering regeneration of dental tissues in adulthood following trauma to the roots. So, at this point, we had the neuromesenchymal stem cells differentiating into odontoblasts. Some of the mesenchymal stem cells on the opposite side in the dentinal sac will differentiate into cementoblasts. Those would be the ones coming into contact with dentin, such as these here. A thin layer of dentin will form the rest of those mesenchymal stem cells will instead turn into fibroblasts forming the periodontal ligament. The growth of the roots initially follows the crown, and for the incisors and canines, the growth of the root remains fairly simple, one crown to one root. However, for multi-rooted teeth, the roots split, forming two or three separate branches, the way that some plants might form separate branches rather than a single trunk 
But that covers the basics of tooth formation. This next leads us to the clinical applications of what we've just learned. Let's begin with anodontia, which is a defect in the initiation stage. This can result in the absence of all or many teeth. If it's just one or two teeth, then it's called hypodontia, or partial anodontia. The missing teeth are most commonly the maxillary lateral incisor, followed by the third molar, followed by mandibular second premolars. We've already covered ectodermal dysplasia, if you're going in the chapters in order. This is a failure of the ectoderm to proliferate or grow as fast as it should. It is not a complete absence of ectoderm. It's just a lack of excessive growth in certain regions, such as the placodes that form the teeth, the hair follicles, the sweat glands, and fingernails. All of these structures form by invagination followed following the rapid growth of ectodermal cells. For patients with ectodermal dysplasia, dental treatments will become necessary. Children may need dentures starting by two years of age, and of course, the dentures will need to be replaced as the face grows in size. Once the face is more or less done growing, then dental implants may become an option. On the other end of the spectrum, if the neural mesenchymal stem cells proliferate too quickly and begin secreting morphogens in too many places, this can lead to hyperdontia, or the formation of extra teeth. This can be a genetic condition. One of the most common is a mesiodens, or an extra central incisor, between the two central incisors. Or an extra molar may form following the third molar, or sometimes an extra premolar may form. Sometimes, rather than forming extra teeth, teeth may grow abnormally large or small. Abnormally large teeth are known as macrodontia, whereas microdontia are abnormally small teeth. And this, of course, can lead to crowding or an extra amount of spacing between teeth. One form of macrodontia is gemination. Like the zodiac sign Gemini, this occurs when a single tooth germ splits and forms twins. However, if the twin teeth are not spaced far enough apart, which usually doesn't happen because they came from the same tooth germ, the twins grow into a single abnormally large tooth that shares a common pulp cavity. Tooth fusion can also form an abnormally large tooth. This occurs when initiation occurs too close together and two root germs start growing close to one another and fuse into a single tooth. The difference between gemination and fusion is that with fusion there will be one abnormally large tooth but a reduced number of teeth because two teeth have fused together. Here is my cartoon of the difference between gemination and fusion. Please again note that gemination is similar to Gemini or twins, not germination like the growth of a seed. With gemination, a single tooth germ grows, encounters an obstacle, and is forced to split into two. And these two may then later fuse to form a single larger tooth. Fusion, on the other hand, is when two separate tooth germs grow, beginning too close to one another, and they fuse together to form one abnormally large tooth that does not share a single pulp cavity. In the case of fusion, once again, there would be a reduced number of teeth visible in the oral cavity because two tooth roots would have fused to form a single crown. Next up is dens in dente. 
Normally, the epithelial cells should invaginate to form a single bud, which will form a single crown. But sometimes you get such excessive growth that that growth folds in backwards on itself. And so you get one crown going in this direction, and a separate smaller one grows in this direction. A second tooth therefore forms inside the first tooth. It tries as best as it can to form an entire tooth on its own, but it will be much smaller and found within the pulp cavity of the first. Dilaceration can occur when the roots do not grow in the proper direction. This can happen when a tooth is growing and it bumps into an obstacle, such as a non-avulsed primary dentition. This can then cause the tooth to grow at an angle rather than straight outwards, forcing the root to grow in a curved formation rather than a straight formation. Sometimes teeth will have more roots than they should. When this occurs, we call those accessory or supernumerary roots. Lastly, sometimes teeth can be lost before they should. That is called an avulsed tooth when the tooth is completely removed from the socket. When this occurs, it is important to keep the living tooth in an environment that is as similar as possible to the oral cavity, such as by sticking the avulsed tooth back into the patient's oral cavity within the buccal vestibule. Saliva can provide nutrients that keep the cells within the pulp alive. Otherwise, milk or by a special transport saline may also be used to help keep the tooth alive as the patient is brought to a dental expert and the tooth can be inserted back into its socket.